Church is meant to be a happy place. It's supposed to be a place of joy. I don't know about you guys, but I used to hate going to church. And then I met Jesus. And then I got it. And I was like, I get it now. I get why church is amazing because this is a, a meeting place for us to encounter him and encounter all of his amazing people. And if you're here for the first time, let me introduce you uh, to myself. My name is Pastor Cap Chatfield. I'm the online pastor here at Love Church. And today I have the privilege of being able to teach from the word of God. But in case our lead pastor is listening, can we just give it up in honor, Pastor Todd Doxson and his wife, Denise. I love you, my man. I'm so grateful for you. His son just got married on Friday, so he's had a pretty great weekend. D-Money, thank you. I don't know where you are. I was going to look at you and call you D-Money, but you're Pastor Casey. But D-Money, if you're listening to this, thank you for your stewardship of the communion moment. It was so beautiful. Hey, guys, do me a favor, please. Let's jump to John chapter 12. Let's get into the Word. Who's ready for the Word? That, that sounds like a group of people who know that the Word of God can change everything as it can. Father, we just ask right now that as this word goes forth, you give us all ears to hear. You give us softened hearts to receive the seed of the word of God that the seed would find good soil. I pray, God, that you would encourage, you would convict, you would change us, and that you would uh, draw us closer to you today. We want to look more like you, Lord, when there's a world out there that's crying out for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And so we, we don't wanna leave this place the same. We wanna leave this place filled up, refueled, prepared, equipped to do your work in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let me share with you guys. If you're new, if you've been coming for a few weeks, maybe you've never seen me teach, maybe you've never seen me on stage. Pretty hard to miss me in the front row though. I, uh, I know, I'm, I'm very out there, I'm very expressive. I'm a Latvian jumping beam, just going for it, giving, giving it all to Jesus. Let me tell you something though. I, uh, I'm not doing it for show. I'm certainly not doing it for my reputation because it's definitely not gonna help my reputation looking like a fool, but why? Why do I get so undignified? before people here? Why do I get undignified before a group of people online, a lot of whom we'll never see in person? Can you imagine if a clip of me going crazy in the front row went viral? Like, that would be, that'd be hilarious. Why do I do it? You guys, I have been saved from so much. If you don't know my story, I went to the University of Miami the real Miami, not the Ohio Miami, Miami, Florida. <laughs> and I went there as an atheist. I went to, this, I went to the, the film program there. I went in hating God, hating Christians. And I'll tell you what, I was chasing after peace in all the wrong places. I would smoke weed three to five times a day looking for peace. I would get drunk three to four nights of the week looking for peace. I would get so blackout drunk that I would wake up next to women, I couldn't even remember their names because I was looking for peace. I was looking for significance. I was looking for affirmation. I was looking for identity. I was looking for in all these places. And by the grace of God, let me tell you, it did not take me long to realize that that was a black hole. The devil overpromises and underdelivers. I was addicted to pornography. I'm going real, can I get real with you guys today? Because I don't want you to look at this, this guy on stage who by the grace of God has the, has the ability and the privilege to preach the word right now and assume that I've always been this way. I have a dark past. I had a hopeless past. But everything changed when I met this guy named Ricardo Bueso. I called him Ricky Beans. He was one of my best friends in college. He was the only Christian I liked. I thought all Christians were weird and lame and annoying, quite frankly, and dumb. Like, I, I thought, like, why would you believe in this God that you can't see? It just felt like a crutch. Yet there was something about his life and his story that was undeniable. So I spent some time getting to know him, and he shared this story with me. It blew my mind. He shared this story 
That, you know, my, my entire life, being a kid going to church every weekend, I thought this, this book, because I literally had a reverend who discouraged me from reading it, because he, he basically said it was irrelevant and boring and confusing. Can you imagine, by the way? And so I thought this thing was, it was just worthy of collecting dust, but I had a friend who sat me down and he shared with me his story about how he had been chasing after peace in all the wrong places like I was. But he encountered a story, someone say story. He encountered the story, this amazing love story of a king who humbled himself, became flesh. This guy named Jesus, a knight in shining armor, who was willing to lay down his life to slay a dragon named Satan, to rescue a person like me who was kept in a high tower under a curse called sin. But because of the grace of God and the, and the, the love of Jesus, Jesus came down to do what only he could do to lay down his life, to rescue me from my sin, to break the curse and not give me a religion to follow, but to give me life, to give me a new life. I never heard it communicated that way. It was an epic love story that God was inviting me into. And so we dialogued for a couple weeks and I just was asking him all these questions about what this meant. And how do you have this relationship with God? He said, it's pretty simple. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead and you will be saved. He said, do you want to do that right now? I was like, nope, but I'll let you know if I ever do. The following morning, I was in my car on the way to the gym. A lot of you already know my story. I, so this is for the people. Sometimes it's important to be reminded of something, not just told something new, but I'm, on, I'm in the car on the way to the gym and I just get bombarded by the Holy Spirit. He just starts tugging on my heart. And he just, like, I didn't even have, I don't even know who God was at this point. And he's just whispering to me. He's saying, just let it go. Just let it go. Stop being the God of your own life. And in this moment, I just start breaking down. I start confessing all of this sin from that weekend, which took a long time because it was a wild weekend in Miami. And I'm confessing all of this sin. And... And it's as if he just gave me the words to say. He like fed me the script. I didn't have religion. I didn't have a background in this stuff. But he spoke to, through me to himself and said, I want to serve you. I don't want this life anymore, but if you want it, you can have it. And in a moment, everything changed. In a moment, it was as if a backpack that I'd been carrying my entire life of shame and guilt and insecurity and anxiety fell off of me. I remember it was like as if my whole life, I didn't even notice, but my whole life was like this blurry black and white television and then all of a sudden I came into 4K resolution. Everything was filled with color again. I went into that car one way and let me tell you, I came out a different person. You can praise God for that, especially if you got a testimony, if you know that God has saved you. I'll tell you what, I was bound in all these sorts of things, and it was only after a few months. It wasn't right away, let me tell you, but after a few months, I started seeing things fall off of my life. I started, when, every time I would spit out a curse word, I would recoil. I was like, what is that? That's a new reaction. I never felt that way before. All of a sudden, when I tried to flip on my phone or my computer to watch pornography, I would get sick to my stomach. I used to only, like every time I saw a woman, I would undress her in my mind when I saw her. All of a sudden, I was seeing women with purity and holiness, seeing them the way that God sees them. I tried smoking a, a, a joint in Czech Republic the summer after I got saved, and it was a huge mistake. Because as soon as I did, God allowed me to see into the spirit realm. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing all of these demons. And I ran back to my apartment. And I repented before God. And I said, God, I will never manipulate spirituality again. You are the only high that I will chase from this day forward. He changed everything. These things fell off of my life. I didn't strive for them. God changed my nature. I was born one way. And then by the grace of God, I was born again. I was completely transformed. That is why I can't keep still. That is why I can't keep silent. Because this story is not my story. It is his story. And I'm just called to be a steward of his story. Well, after I moved to, to uh, Omaha, 
from Miami. You might be thinking, what on earth were you thinking? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't my idea. God spoke to me. I was like, God, I, had, I graduate film school with the Holy Spirit and a film degree. Very interesting collection of ingredients. And I said, what do you want to do with this? Do you want me to go to LA? Do you want me to go to New York? Do you want me to stay in Miami? And he said, spoke to me in a dream and said, actually, I want you to start your film career in Omaha, Nebraska. And I said, where is that? And I opened up my phone, pull up Apple Maps. I was like, I would have never guessed. It's like right in the middle of the country. I'm thinking there's maybe at least mountains or like whatever. Nope, flat, corn, cold, with no snow. Worst kind of cold you can get. But the people are amazing, by the way. I love the people here in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. And I'm starting to like the football team too. Praise God for a bye week, right? It's, at least we can be neutral, like have our emotions neutral this week. So I love it here, but, but God spoke to me and told me to move. And I mean, a lot of people are thinking the same thing. Like, bro, like you live in Miami. Why are you going to Omaha? I go to Omaha, pack my bags, drive. At one point while I'm here, I go to a FedEx to mail something. I can't even remember what. But I'm talking to the lady behind the counter. And she asked for my ID for some reason. So I give her my ID. And I had my Florida driver's license still. And she said, Florida? What are you doing in Omaha, Nebraska? And... I was on my way to, to some meeting. I was running late. I was busy. I was on my mind. And I said, oh, you know, work. And she said, oh, okay. Hand me back my driver's license. I get in the car. And the same Holy Spirit who hounded me in the car in Miami is now hounding me in the car in Omaha, Nebraska. And he says to me, oh, really? You're here for work, huh? And I'm like, nope, that's not God. Nope, I'm just... That was just me, that was just me. Like, I gotta go to this thing. And the Holy Spirit is just gripping me with a fear of God right now. And he's saying to me, this isn't your story, Cap. This is my story. You go back in there and you tell her why you're in Omaha, Nebraska. And I was like, yes, sir. You turn, go back to the FedEx. Hi, she's like, whoa, hi. He's like, do you remember me? She's like, yeah, you were just here 10 minutes ago. And I said, I'm back. She's like, clearly you are. And I said, I got to tell you why I'm back. I lied to you. I'm not here for work. And I was leaving here, and God spoke to me and told me to tell you, come back here and tell you why I'm really here. I got to tell, I said, Brrr. I start divulging all this information, more information than she asked for. And she's like, oh my gosh, like they don't pay me enough to do this thing. And I'm just, I'm sharing this. And like, I'm kind of in this moment, like if you ever preach or grab a microphone, sometimes you have this like, like dual personality syndrome where like you're speaking, but then there's this voice in the back of your head like, what am I talking about right now? And I'm having that moment with her and I'm just like, my gums are flapping, I'm still talking. And then I come to this place where it's like this awkward silence. And she's like looking at me and I'm looking at her and all I could say was, God wants to write an amazing story through you too. And then she was like, that, that's cool. And I said, okay, bye. And then, and then I'm gone. And I don't know, if, I don't, I've never seen her ever again. Maybe she'll come back to church one of these days. It was awkward. It was weird. It, it was, if I, I fumbled through it, but can I tell you something? It wasn't mine to decide what to do with. And I believe in a room this size, and for people online, there are many of us who are unwilling to steward the story of what God has done in us, but you have no idea. You have no idea how your story might actually unlock the ending to somebody who's in the middle of their story. The Bible says that your testimony is the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. What does that mean? What he'll do for one, he'll do for any. And all of creation is crying out for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed and say, I'm not here on accident. I didn't arrive because I gave myself permission. I was called, anointed, ordained by God to be here in this moment to tell you what he did in my life and invite you to experience that same transformation that I've experienced. Woohoo, yeah, that deserves a woohoo. Because I look across this room and I know that there's people in here who have the most amazing testimonies. My question to you is, are you stewarding? I'm gonna let me tell you this. Your testimony, my testimony, I'm gonna get it. Can I get in your grill? I love you. I'm not mad. But let me, get in, let me get in our grills for a second. Our testimony is not that I go to a nice church. 
Our testimony is not that I go to a church with great worship music and a great kids program and a great uh, rev rally. All those things are amazing. That's not your testimony. Your testimony is that you were once dead in sin and now you're alive in God. Your testimony is that you were once broken and sick and abandoned and God adopted you and changed you and healed you and put new clothes on your back and gave you a new name and a new nature and a new identity. That is your testimony. Why do a lot of people not share their testimony? I have a few, few reasons why I was meditating on this. Some people are bored of their testimony. Some people have been walking with God for 30 years and they haven't stacked story on top of the foundation of their salvation moment. Are you catching what I'm saying? A lot of us are drifting through life just grateful that we've been saved, but we are not living by faith. And let me tell you, can I tell you something? Everything in your life should prophesy of God's goodness. Your house should prophesy of God's goodness. When people get a ride from you to work and they're like, this is a nice car. Or man, like, tell me. What? I, all I can tell you is God is good and Jesus is faithful. Man, you got an amazing wife. You got amazing kids. They're super well trained. You even, your dog is well trained. What? Let me tell you, I'm not that sweet. Jesus is faithful. Let me tell you a story. Everything in your life and my life should prophesy of God's goodness. If you're bored of your testimony, you're not stacking enough stories. You're not walking by faith enough. There's more. There's more for you. This is an invitation to more. Another reason why people don't share or steward their testimony is people don't believe their testimony is even real. People discredit their own testimony. People look at what God has done. And I had an encounter with God this many years ago. I went forward at church. It was amazing. But man, I'm still struggling with these things. I'm still struggling with these mindsets. These words still come out of my mouth that I don't want them to come out. Let me tell you, can I just praise God for a second? There was a moment in your life when you wouldn't have even cared. And now you care. You know why you care? Because the living God has made a home inside of you and he is committed to completing in you what God has begun in you. In Jesus' name. Do not disqualify or discredit yourself. Your testimony is real and there's more for you. Another reason why people don't share their testimony is because they take credit for their testimony. This is, this is something that usually happens when we just come into the faith. So there's no shame here, but this is a time to repent for sure. People ask you, how'd you build your business? Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm a self-made man. I've been working real hard. No, you are not a self-made man. None of us are self-made. We all stand on the shoulders of people before us, and more importantly, God is faithful. God is the one who gave you the ability. God is the one who gave you the wisdom. And I'm telling you, you want to live a shallow life, take all the credit for what God's doing. Right. Testify to Jesus of his faithfulness. Finally, some of you don't feel like you even have a story to share. I got two things for you. If you're like, man, I'm kind of new to this thing. I'm kind of just checking out church. I'm tuning online, somehow I just randomly popped up on YouTube and I'm watching this, I don't even know why I'm watching it, but I'm motivated to click away, don't click away. Let me tell you right now, if you don't have a God-sized story yet of God's faithfulness, two things I want you to do. Number one, you gotta get surrounded by testimony. You gotta join a group at Love Church. You gotta get surrounded by people the amount of people who come and, and they're like, man, Pastor Cap, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with my kid. My kid is struggling with anxiety. They're addicted to drugs. What do I do? Hey, let me connect you to somebody who has a story. Let me connect you to somebody who walked, man, my marriage is, I, I, like, my, my husband is cheating on me and now he says he wants to come back. I don't know how to forgive. What do I do? Hey, let me connect you to somebody in our body with a story. If you keep on coming into this place and you don't get known by other people by joining a group, let me tell you, these people, the people here, we call it Love Church for a reason. These people will love you right where you're at, but you need to understand a different future for your story. You need to understand what God has done for one he's willing to do for you. Get surrounded by testimony. I want you to download the Love Church app at some point. Check out the Love Church Story podcast. We, do the, we don't do these podcasts because we have nothing else to do. We do these podcasts because we want to document what God is doing in the life of this church so that it could be of benefit to you, so that you can have a breakthrough and understand if God could do it for them, maybe he wants to do it for me. The last thing I would say is stick around to the end. If you're in this place today where you're like, I wanna know that God has really has got a plan for me, I wanna give you an opportunity at the end of this message. But before we do that, 
I want to share with you a quick story from the Bible. This reading from this past week, John chapter 12, or John chapter 11, we learned about a guy named Lazarus. Lazarus was one of Jesus' best friends. It's funny, as we're worshiping this morning and singing this song about Jesus being our friend, that's one thing I love about Jesus that you don't see in other religions. Other religions, it's so much about duty and submission and the report card. And trust me, God is a judge. He's gonna judge us in how we live. But there's a difference when you've been forgiven of your sin and then you're judged on what you do with that forgiveness and just trying to earn God's favor all in your own strength. And what Jesus invites us into is not just this begrudging ob obligation of submitting to the king, but friendship. Yeah. Jesus wants to be your friend. He wants to talk to you like a friend. And one of Jesus' best friends while Jesus was on planet Earth was this guy named Lazarus. Lazarus got really sick. He got so sick that he actually ended up dying. He was dead. They put him in a tomb. Jesus shows up four days later. Everybody thought that he was being insensitive and rude to show up this late. But Jesus shows up. He had a plan. He was being sent by God to manifest the glory of God to, to Lazarus and to everybody else who witnessed this. Lazarus was in the tomb. And Jesus shows up and gives a mighty shout and says, Lazarus, come out of that tomb. Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for four days. He's so dead, the Bible in the King James Version said he stinketh. That's like more than stink, like super. You better believe after a second encounter, my armpits be stinketh up here. So give me some grace. I'm trying to give you guys everything I can. Lazarus was dead, dead, dead. Jesus calls him for, says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, comes out of the tomb, walks out, and then Jesus turns to everybody else around him and says, take off his grave clothes. Why? Because they don't fit him anymore. He's a completely new person. I want to just, with the remaining time, this will be interesting because I haven't even gotten to my points yet. We will. We'll, we'll figure out how to squeeze them in. Holy Spirit, you just say what you want to say to your people. Here's what I want you to know. If you want to discredit your own testimony because you feel like, man, I haven't figured all these things out yet, the things, the behaviors, the habits, the mindsets, the words that fly out of your mouth and those unfavorable moments, grave clothes. Grave clothes. It's not who you are anymore. It's not your identity. Jesus Christ came to planet Earth. He who knew no sin became sin that you might become the righteousness of God in him. So in any moment when you feel like my testimony isn't worthy of sharing, I want you to look yourself in the mirror. I want you to make a mockery of the devil, and I want you to thank God that you were a different person, that it wasn't even about you in the first place. You want, I want you to look in the mirror. I want you to check, check this out. You guys online, if you struggle with shame and guilt and regret, I want you to look yourself in the eyes and declare, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Anytime you're tempted to pick up a blunt, anytime you're tempted to pick up the bottle, anytime you're tempted to open up the screen and watch something you shouldn't watch, you declare over yourself, no, I'm not, who that, I'm not that person anymore. I'm not dead in that tomb. I've been raised to life. I am no longer my sin and my past. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You gotta steward your story over yourself. You gotta remind the devil the spectacle that Jesus made for him on that cross by disempowering him forever. Here's the scripture I want us to focus on today. John chapter 12, verses nine through 11. I gave you the backstory about Lazarus. These three verses to me, I think it's nine through, nine through 11, perfect. These few verses are very interesting to me. I've, I've read the Bible a handful of times. I read this story a handful of times. This has never popped off the page like it has for me this week. I want you to check this out. John 12, 9 through 11 says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Here's the first point I want you to write down. Number one, your testimony draws a crowd. For those of you who are like, I'm super practical, Cap, bless you, by the way. God bless you again. For those of you who are super practical and you're like, Cap, give me the handles. What, how do I share my story? Here's your takeaway. Once you leave here, I want you to write this on your, on, uh, in your notes. 
What is my five second testimony? That's all you need, five seconds. You remember the story of the guy who was blind? Jesus came to him, healed him of his blindness on the Sabbath. All of the religious leaders are freaking out because he's like doing this thing that he wasn't supposed to do, quote unquote, on the Sabbath. And so they're like badgering this guy who just got healed with questions. Who was it? Who did it? How did he do it? And he's just like, you could tell he's just annoyed by these guys. He's like, dude, like for real? Like I, I just got my eyesight 30 minutes ago. Like I couldn't even see the guy and then he left. And you know what he says? He says, I don't know what to tell you. All I can say is once I was blind and now I can see. I'm telling you, you don't, gotta, you don't have to be a theologian. Grow in doctrine, great. Elevating your faith, elevating your knowledge, awesome. But your testimony can be a five second testimony that gives somebody a different picture for their future. It can be that simple. You can praise God for that. You can absolutely praise God. But here's what I want you to do practically. I want you in your journals, in your, in your phones, I want you to write down, I was blank, but now I'm blank by the grace of God. I was blank, but now I'm blank. I want you to arm yourself with this testimony. When people say, hey, how are you doing? You know what? I'm doing really great because by the grace of God, I was this and now I'm this. Hey, why is your family, give me some tips on parenting. You seem like you got parenting figured out. Well, I'll, let me just tell you this. Before, I'll give you some tips, but let me tell you this. Before Jesus, I was blank, but because of Jesus, now I'm this. You see what I'm saying? You, in, a, in five seconds, are able to encapsulate the prophecy of what Jesus wants to do in somebody else. And you're able to deliver that as a seed into people's hearts. And you know what happens when that seed goes into the soil of people's hearts? It's like, and then you're like, uh, did anything happen? Just give it time, because that starts to take root. It starts to take root, and all of a sudden, the people that you share the story with, they're thinking about all the, you know, they're thinking, man, that sounds kind of weird. I've never heard of that. What, what's happening? That seed is taking ground in people's hearts. I got people in college. I, I, when, I, when I got saved in college, I basically turned in my cool card. I was this decently popular guy on campus. Within 48 hours, I was a Jesus freak, and nobody wanted to talk to me. Like legit, it was, it was really strange. Like I was like, everybody, wow, everybody hates me. That was, that was pretty quick. But what's amazing is even in my fraternity when everybody was making fun of me thinking that this was just a fad and I had like done shrooms or something and had a crazy trip or whatever. What happened was a few years later, I would have some of these guys reach out to me one-on-one -on -one, either in an Instagram direct message and say, hey, I need to talk to you. We got people saying yes, because we, we, you know there's people in your life who knew the previous version of you, the 1.0 version of you, and now they see the 2.0 version of you, and time has passed, and a testimony has been built, and they see that it's not a fad, and they're saying, no, there's something different about that person. I know who they were when they were dead in that tomb, and all of a sudden, they're alive, and they're declaring something I've never heard before. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, the reason why you don't have people coming to you and flocking to hear your testimony right now is because you're not stewarding the small version of it. God will only bless what you faithfully steward. But if you are willing to say, God, I don't care how dumb I am or dumb, how dumb I sound, I am willing to my coworker and to my boss, I'm willing to testify of what you've done in my life. I can guarantee you, God will draw your crowd. There are people that God has called you to reach that I'll never reach and they are waiting. Eternity in their hearts is crying out for you to show up and say, guess what, guys? I'm not the hero of my story. I'm not the main character. But you want me to tell you who is? Jesus is, and he wants to do a similar thing in your life. That is what God's inviting you into. God does not want you to live a life of insignificance. God wants you to steward a story that draws the crowd you were always destined to reach. The second point is that your testimony defies the devil. It defies the enemy. Check this out, John chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. I never caught that. That was what really stuck out to me. Because we know that Jesus was being hunted down for the things that he was saying. I didn't, re I didn't catch though that Lazarus was being hunted down. Some people in this room are so terrified of sharing their testimony because they're afraid of, what if I get fired? What if I get canceled? What if my family rejects me? 
We have somebody in the online community, her name's Andrea. She started sharing her faith openly at work. She's on the verge of losing her job because of it. But let me tell you, any job that you lose for your testimony in Jesus is actually a promotion. Is actually a promotion, yes. You gotta catch that. Because as long as you think that you're in control and it's your story, even a worldly promotion is actually a demotion in the kingdom. Here's what you gotta catch. Your story will be polarizing. I don't want you to think that when you share your story of what Jesus has done in you and through you, that everybody's going to love it. Guess what? Most people won't. The Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The Bible says that your testimony is actually the stench of death to those who are condemned. But here's the good news. The good news is, is that it is also the aroma of life to those who are being saved. Do not be discouraged. When you share your, your faith with your family members and, and they reject you for it, I can guarantee you there's gonna be people coming back years later who say, hey, I'm ready to talk. That story, I wasn't ready to hear it then, but I could really use that right now. Why? Because it defies the devil. It makes a spectacle of what he tried to do, the generational curse that he tried to breed through you. It ran through your family, but it ran into you in Jesus' name, and it stops moving forward. That is why the devil works overtime to get you to keep your mouth shut. Because when you refuse, or let me tell you this, when you open up your mouth and testify of what Jesus has done, hell lost another one. Testify of what Jesus has done. The final point is your testimony demands a response. John 12, 11. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The Bible says that the word of God doesn't return void. When you share the message of Jesus, let me tell you the only failure, the only failure is keeping your mouth shut. The only failure is not speaking up. There's a story about a guy named Peter. Peter in the Bible was one of Jesus' closest guys. He walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus do all of these miracles. And you'd think that somebody that close to Jesus, oh, I'll never deny you, Jesus. I'll never betray you. This guy who saw Jesus do all that he did, on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, he denied him three times. He said, I, I, I don't know that guy. I have nothing to do with that man. Kind of reminds me of myself at that FedEx office. Oh, I'm just here for work. I don't have any relationship to that. When this moment happened, as, as, as Peter denied Jesus on the third time, Peter caught eyes with Jesus. After Jesus had been beaten, they punched him, they pulled out his beard, they spat on him. He caught eyes with Jesus. And conviction filled his heart. He had been denying his Lord and his best friend. And it, it wrecked him so hard that he literally went away and wept bitterly. Can I get, I wanna get very real with some people in this room. There are people in this room who have lost loved ones. And they, they, you lost them unexpectedly, you lost them suddenly, and you are filled with regret and shame because you missed the opportunity to testify of what Jesus had done. And now you don't know where they're spending eternity. Now you don't know if they received the gospel of God. And the reality is that the Bible says that the wages of all of our sin, all of our rebellion against God is death. And what we deserve is death, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Hell, separated from God, receiving the wrath of God justly for what we did in rebelling against him. That's where most people are going. And let me tell you, there are more people, there are more people drifting into eternity, into hell, having not heard this gospel, then there are people who have heard it. And if you're in this place where you're saying, God, like, I missed it. Would you give me another shot? Let me tell you, Jesus wants to give you another opportunity. But do not leave this place being casual about your testimony any longer. Peter had this moment. Peter had this moment where after weeping bitterly, Jesus rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he gave Peter another shot. He baptized Peter and the disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit. G or Peter stood up and preached to a room of thousands of people. And he testified. And he said, I'm no longer denying this man. 
This man has done too much for me to stay silent any longer. I've seen him heal the sick. I've seen him raise the dead. I've seen him open blind eyes. And you all crucified him. But he rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he calls men to repent and to come into his kingdom. And that day, 2,000, no, 3,000, 3,000 people were brought into the kingdom that very day. Let me tell you, it is not too late for you to get back on the horse. It is not too late for you to start stewarding your story. It will demand a response from a dying and confused world. But will you steward it well? Father, I pray right now for a spirit of boldness to come upon us. That we would stop being so casual about what you did, the high price that you paid for us. There are people in this room who have been delivered from sexual perversion. It's time for them to share their story that other captives might be set free. There are people in this room who are ashamed of, of going out outside of their marriage. Father, I thank you that it is their time to speak up and to say, God has another plan. God will give you a second chance. God, I thank you. I thank you that those who are ashamed, ashamed of what they're currently walking through, the things that they're still struggling with. God, I thank you that Lazarus played no part in his resurrection. He was a recipient in the same way. God, you sovereignly picked us out of the pit. We had no say in the matter. You did it sovereignly. It's not up to us. It's by your spirit. Father, I pray you would grip us. Grip us with the fear of you, that we would stop fearing man, we'd stop trying to be liked by everybody, and we would be focused on sowing the seed of testimony that will defy the enemy and demand a response in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna invite you guys to stand to your feet. We only have a few moments here, but I did promise this. If there are people in this place who are saying, Pastor Cap, Maybe this is my first time here, or maybe I've been coming here for a while, and quite honestly, I don't have a Jesus story. But I can relate to what you said. I'm bound in this, I'm struggling with this. I wanna change, let me tell you, the only reason that you want to change is because the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart right now and is saying that he has way more in store for you. And the invitation is so stinking, stinketh, simple. It's so basic. Jesus says, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, it will be sealed. You will be saved. But Jesus died a public death for you that you might make a public confession for him. The Bible talks about repentance. What's repentance? Repentance is saying, God, I've been living my life this way for too long. I'm making a change. I'm making a Yui. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to live for you. And I might not get it perfect, but I thank you, God, that your spirit will endure, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, and when I fall down, you will forgive me again. I want that spirit. If there's anybody in this place that wants forgiveness of their sin and wants today to be the day, that the BC version of you gets buried and left in the tomb, the grave clothes fall off, and you begin walking in the newness of life. As the team plays behind me, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward even right now. Come out of your seat. 